settle in because this is going to be a long one. Hi, my name is Rachel and today we're talking back to talking back to parody culture. I would do this um, mano a mano. I would do this, you know, one to one. This is not one to one in sign in ASL. Yikes. I would do this, you know, face to face if I could. I would I would try to have a conversation with this author, but um, she preemptively blocked me on Twitter. So <laughs> um, if this book were a meme, it would be this, um, or maybe this, or maybe this. All three. Combo of all three, the rest together. But what it is not is helpful. If I could rename this book so that it accurately displays what is inside, because the title is misleading uh, on purpose, which is why somebody called it a bait and switch to which the author got upsetty spaghetti. So my new names for this would be repackaging purity culture. Purity culture, not an alternative, just with fun new colors. Trauma, but now with 50% more gaslighting. How to eat the same shitty meal but make it taste different. Slut shaming, but passive aggressive. Tokenizing the queers, and more things I'll do to make myself seem hip. Purity culture, but without the ugly jewelry we got in the 90s. Patronizing victims of purity culture with a smile. If you've read it, leave your alternative titles down below. Uh, before I start, you think I started? I didn't. I want to say this. I am willing to admit that this book did a few things right. However, number one, they are the bare minimum and I no longer give people lots of credit for doing the bare minimum. What do you want? Applause? Though I will list what she did right in a second. And number two, this book has bad that so vastly outweighs the positive that the bare minimum is almost moot. And frankly, that needs to be stated. All right, here's what she got right. Let's get this out of the way real quick. Singleness in the church. It's it's weird and awkward. It's treated like an issue that needs to be fixed and that's dehumanizing. Another thing, fertility. The way that it's talked about in church is harmful. Number three, not talking about sex has led people to idolize sex, but also virginity. And then them being concerned, um, confused, and then disappointed when things happen to them like vaginismus, which we don't know about because we don't talk about sex in the church. I say we as if I didn't leave fundamentalism like so long ago. Was it like six years now? And then last but certainly not least, sexual abuse is about power. We need to talk about that in the church. However, she still then fails to talk about sexual assault in a way that I found helpful in the end, so that needs to be said. Again, that's basically it, uh, and as I said, bare minimum. All right, I'm gonna start with the foreword, but first I'm going to summarize what purity culture is versus what this author's new version of purity culture 2.0, which is not how she would describe it, is. So the original purity culture is is a term often used for the evangelical movement that attempts to promote a biblical view of purity by discouraging dating, promoting virginity before marriage, often through the use of tools like purity pledges, symbols like purity rings, and even purity balls, which were only for girls. More on that later. The biblical view of purity here being referred to comes from 1 Thessalonians 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, talking back to purity culture calls for a, a new kind of purity culture. I, I was going to try to put it in her words, but I can't. I'd be lying, just like her. She says, God and his glory are the goal of purity. Practicing purity is a form of worship. Any way we, another way we get to praise God through obedience with our bodies, hearts, and thoughts. It's another way to thank him for rescuing us from the domain of darkness and transferring us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We are called to purity because we are called to be like Jesus, our creator, God, and friend. See a difference? Me neither. That's because there is not one. I mean, sure, you took away the jewelry. What else? I think? Okay. Um, the issues with this book abound and it starts right from the beginnings. Scott Sauls does the foreword and uh, I don't like him. Uh, he regurgitates the same old purity, purity bullshit immediately. Like, 
Oh, oh, page one, boom, purity bullshit. Which is interesting because then Rachel Joy Welcher seems to like <laughs> not agree with him throughout the book, but then sort of like passively it felt like she was also agreeing with herself. Actually, real quick before I get into the foreword, and this isn't even in my notes, but I'm just realizing now how not well this was written. Not only are the contradictions like boundless, like there's so many of them, she contradicts herself constantly. It's also just not well written in the fact that it's set up weird. It's like little essay after little essay that she like tries to slap into <laughs> chapters that sort of are based around a theme and I don't like it. It's not good. It's not set up well. I didn't like that. It might work for some people which I will I, I will say that that's probably a subjective thing. Um, Another thing is that she quotes other books incessantly. Incessantly. This is basically just her quoting a bunch of people and saying beloved which god if she said beloved to me one more time she's like beloved here's what I think and it's like I you, you mostly don't even quote the bible you quote other people more than you actually quote Jesus isn't that an issue baby it feels like an issue I'm just saying it's just like book after book after book after book and it's like I don't I don't care about any of these books like I'm here to read your thoughts on things so that I can review your book not 10,000 other books you've written read read anyway back to the foreword Scott Sauls who sucks writes the foreword here's some some of his lines uh, that I hate. This vision affirms the sometimes scandalous belief that sexual intercourse, a glorious gift from God, gift chiefly for human intimacy, pleasure, and procreation, is reserved uniquely for marriage between one man and one woman. Okay, well I'm queer, so. If a woman gave birth to a girl, the husband would decide whether they should keep the child or throw her away, akin to a postpartum abortion as it were. No, no. This is why I immediately knew this book was going to get one star from me, because I, listen, I I fuck my notes. Listen to me. Postpartum, which means after birth, abortion is not a thing. If you look up the definition of abortion, it means to end a pregnancy. How do you give an abortion? How do you end a pregnancy if the pregnancy is already ended? That's not a thing. It's not a thing. Stop saying it. Stop saying it's a thing. Shut the fuck up, Scott. <clears throat> anyway, sorry. In our 21st century context, we would like to think of ourselves as more enlightened, as if we have somehow progressed beyond such ugly human realities. Ugly human realities. But have we? The emergence of and growing popularity of pornography, non-married cohabitation, LGBTQ plus concerns and culture, polyamorous arrangements, and hookup culture attest otherwise. You just called LGBTQ people ugly human realities. Ours is a culture of sexual confusion, oppression, and slavery that masks itself as a culture of sexual freedom. In the sexual revolution climate, what is needed is not less sexual freedom, but better and healthier sexual freedom. Those who are unmarried, like the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ, are free to embrace countercultural chastity as a high, holy, and praiseworthy calling. In doing so, these men and women affirms God's unique design for sex, and in doing so, protect their own souls from injury. Protect their own own souls from injury. My favorite part, sex works a lot like fire. When removed from its protective boundaries, it burns us and leaves scars. I just, Rachel Welter, if you're listening to this, this is James Dobson. This is purity culture. This is exactly everything that we were traumatized by in the 90s and you have peddled it back out to a new generation and in doing so, in the very fucking forward of your book, you have harm. Period. There's, I'm not being you know, cultural. You're not being just a stick in the mud. You are actively putting out things that harm people by saying and agreeing with a man in your book who says sex is like fire. It burns and it scars. You have done what you claim that you set out to retract. That's fucked. What is needed not only in our own culture, but in every culture, as well as every bedroom, every boardroom, every big screen, every TV screen, every computer screen, shut up, is a well-articulated, biblical, grounded, compelling, and life-giving answer to the shame of promiscuity culture on the one hand and the shame of purity culture on the other. You literally just said that sex is like fire and it scars and it burns. 
Hello? Yes, you're so different from the shame of purity culture, please. What's needed is a freshly painted yet anciently grounded vision for sex, marriage, singleness, gender, and love that upholds and advances conviction and compassion. I believe that Rachel has done a masterful job in painting that vision. I'll tell you what she painted. She took purity culture, painted over it, and said, look a new thing. No, 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 <laughs> no. It's the same old shit. In the beginning of her own book, Rachel lists the different books that we grew up reading in the 90s in, you know, the heyday of purity culture. We were inundated books like uh, I Kiss Dating Bi Goodbye by Joshua Harris. That was like a really big one, but also And the Bride Wore White, Elizabeth Elliot's books. Joshua Harris has since renounced what he taught, which thank God for him. Anyway, Rachel says, I often finish these books more ashamed of my sexuality than when I had started them. And immediately I'm scratching my head reading this sentence because ma'am, how the fuck is your book any different? When the, the very forward just ages ago had Scott saying that it, it causes that sex causes soul injuries and that it burns and scars like fire. Similar to in the introduction she immediately demonizes queerness and sex work saying over the years I have talked with students who were sexually abused addicted to pornography wrestling with same-sex attraction. Yes because to Rachel it is an affliction to wrestle with being queer. Anyway I'm not wrestling. I'm, I'm sitting pretty just gay. I'm actually pan. You can google it. She says even evangelical purity culture was not a wicked movement but rather an earnest response to the age-old problem of immorality and the modern crisis of STDs and modern pregnancy. This for which she cites no sources and that's because um, it there isn't one. That statement is categorically false. It was never about lowering the teen pregnancy rate or the STD rate. It was about control and it persists now because it's still about control because even though we have the data that shows that abstinence education does not lower rates of pregnancy or STDs, we keep pushing it. In fact, in the Florida 2021 state statutes for education, abstinence is all that's taught, and that's what was taught to me. So explain yourself. Purity culture was born out of a desire to control people, mainly women, period. She actually contradicts herself in the next chapter, something she does constantly, saying, the Christian community I was raised in in the late 20th and early 21st century America tried to tame teenage sexuality by promoting an evangelical Christian purity culture, a movement that utilized pledges, books, and events to promote sexual abstinence outside of marriage. You literally just said it, to tame teenage sexuality. Control. Control teens, making sure that they don't have sex. At the end of chapter one, she said, if you are reading along alone right now, please make it a goal to at least bring uh, one of these topics into real life conversation with someone else. Baby, I got you. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> like, I'm doing a whole fucking video. No problem. Chapter two, she talks about the idol of virginity. Um, she brings up how demeaning it is, though I don't know if she used the word demeaning, but that's the feeling I got with how demeaning it is to create to uh, compare somebody who has had sex to a torn up piece of paper or piece of chewed up gum, which is something that we were taught in purity culture. She says, the trauma of these visual metaphors speaks louder than any footnote about second chances, which <laughs> the author, so she is agreeing that these, these are bad, but then explain why Scott is in her introduction saying that sex is playing with fire and will burn and scar you. Again, I'm just gonna keep referring back to it. It's literally the first page of your book. But then she even contradicts herself and her own words, not just having Scott in her book, but contradicts herself with her own words by likening us to all being broken people. She says that she loves a quote from another book that describes us all as sexually broken and on a journey towards wholeness. This is the same toxicity preached by regular regular purity culture that I have a huge problem with. Telling people that they are inherently broken is so awful and toxic. It just is. There's no excuse. You think that you're doing good by sharing some good news with them that don't worry, you're so broken, but Jesus loves you and he died for your brokenness. You are not being loving by telling them this. You are setting people down a path, the same path that I walked, that all of us who dealt with purity culture in the 90s walked. They are going to feel like they are not inherently valuable unless they are actively denying parts of themselves every moment of every day and trying to substitute in 
Jesus. She calls this, and this is a quote, devastating us into acknowledging our need for a savior. That is emotional manipulation. That's scamming people into doing what you want them to do. That's harmful. And then in the literal next quote, after calling everybody broken, she says, you were valuable before you did anything and you're valuable even if you've done stuff. But that hinges on the idea that while technically you're broken, Jesus died for your brokenness even though God was the one that set you up to be broken in the first place. Like the whole system was set up so we were born into sin nature. So we were born broken and our only hope out of the system that God created is more God. What? I just think it's really funny how if everyone knows, well everyone should know, that if your partner says you're broken, no one is ever going to love you like I love you because you're so flawed and awful. I am the only one for you. Your value only comes by being in a relationship with me. We, we all should know, we all know that that is abuse, but apparently when Jesus does it, it's fine? Apparently that's the epitome of love, is to create a bunch of beings, make them broken, tell them that they're broken so that they'll be self-loathing, and tell them the way that you naturally are is bad. Don't trust yourself, only trust me. Struggle your whole life against your own nature that I created, and instead of being like yourself, be like me and worship me. Wow, that's so super loving and um, not manipulative at all. I would definitely treat my own kids like that. Herein is why purity culture is toxic, because it teaches you self-hate. And that your only chance to not hate yourself completely is to link yourself, your entire existence, to a spiritual being. Purity culture teaches that you are inherently a broken and impure being, and that normal thoughts and biological responses are actually sin. That's your sin nature that you need to police within yourself. You have to actively fight against yourself day in and day out. It's not just the virginity issue that's the problem. It's the whole damn thing that's got to go. Like, great, she says that idolizing virginity is a bad thing. Okay, cool, but that's not the whole thing. That's not why purity culture was bad. You are still doing the rest of it. It's like, I say, purity culture is toxic. Rachel Joy Welcher, yeah, absolutely, virginity culture is toxic. Me, no, you just changed one word. The emphasis on the obligation for purity is a problem. Striving to be, you know, pure like you assume Jesus was, that's a problem. Her, yeah, I know, virginity is an idol. N no, I mean, yes, but no, that's not what I said. Purity culture, the whole of it is toxic. Her, well, that's just sin lying to you. Call me a stick in the mud if you want. Man, but she really thinks that she's distancing herself from like the whole of, of purity culture. Despite, and this is fucking what? Describing her version of good purity culture as Jesus's call for the pursuit of whole person purity, which includes not only the hymen, but our whole body, mind, and heart. Not only the hymen? Ma'am, it's 2022. This is how I know you did not consult one doctor. Not only is this fucking stupid, it's fucking false because Jesus never said jack shit about a hymen anyway. This is so dangerous. Hymens do not equal virginity. Some people are just born without them. A lot of people's break during non-sexual activity. This is her telling you that your mind, your body, your soul, including your hymen, what the fuck, I cannot believe that she put that in there, are all part of purity that you need to be striving for. Not just virginity, the whole body. What? You, you're doing more than what purity culture originally did. You're worse, actually. In fact, she's still recommending the same old shit that they recommended, like dressing modestly. She's still talking about virginity being inextricably linked to a hymen. She's talking about how Jesus is saying things about hymens that he never said. She's still preaching you are broken theology. She is the same as purity culture of old. She's just being more passive aggressive about it and pretending she's doing a solid kindness, which honestly makes it worse for me. She and I vehemently disagree on many things. <laughs> But one of the things that we disagree on is that the old purity culture is toxic because they made things individualistic. She says in the book, purity rhetoric essentially borrows the feminist message of my body, my choice in order to convince teenagers that sexual abstinence is about asserting their agency. Yeah, because we really wouldn't want to teach uh, teenagers about asserting their agency. That would be terrible. The purity movement tried to make chastity attractive by highlighting the rebellion required to say no to premarital sex in a culture so used to saying yes. The emphasis on personal choice included a 
public element. This is where purity rings, necklaces, and events like father-daughter purity balls came into vogue. Pursuing sexual purity for the sake of one's identity and reputation is a foundation built on shifting sand. <sighs> okay, let me explain. So basically, here she's making the point that when your purity is about you, you're not glorifying God. And therefore, that was the problem with old purity culture is that they made purity a selfish thing. That was their problem, which that's harmful on its own. But actually, what I want to point out here is that she's missing the mark on a different point. How can it be likened to a personal choice to have participated as a girl in a purity ball? It's not a personal choice because when you're doing that, it's a young girl making that commitment of her virginity to her father, her future husband, and Jesus. That's three men that she's making her virginity about, all of which are not her. That's not a personal choice at all. That's culturally conditioning young girls and women to see their virginity as a commodity that does not even belong to them at all, but belongs to three different men. That in and of itself is such a major fucking problem that she completely ignored and didn't talk about in order to make a bad point about whether or not somebody is self-absorbed about their pureness. Like we can have a conversation about empowering people on an individual level about agency over their own bodies, and we should because she's fucking wrong about that. But you cannot bring up girls, young girls, going through purity balls and then seriously try to make the case to me that the girl is being selfish and making her sexual identity about herself in that situation. What the fuck are you talking about? <sighs> she talks about modesty. Um, she tries to make the case that it's still important, but for another reason and fails. Um, I don't even want to get into all that in the interest of time. I'm just going to basically summarize for you. Um, she talks about men's like men right and how men um how how gross it is that we're supposed to be modest for men and take responsibility over men looking at us right she said the problem of male lust is not solved by looking away from women okay jesus said if your right eye offends thee then pluck it out but all right so yeah i agree that it's not solved by just looking away what do you think it's solved by her by by looking at them correctly define correctly her as sisters, image bearers, and co-heirs of the kingdom of God. No, no, you messed up again. No, no, no. Women are people. Women are people. They do not need to be your sister, your co-heir to the kingdom of God, your mother, your aunt, your neighbor. They are people. Don't assault people, period. That's what you need to say to men. No matter who they are, don't assault women. <laughs> Male lust is not solved by saying, this is your sister, your co-heir to the kingdom of God. It is solved by saying, men, do better, be responsible. Women don't have to be anything for you to get your shit together. I shouldn't have to explain this in 2022, I'm exhausted. She says, we dehumanize women when we depict them as obstacles rather than allies in faith. And we dehumanize men when we depict them as monsters who cannot control their lust. Instead, let self-control be taught not only as possible, but as good for our flourishing within the church as beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us begin with dignity and go from there. This irks me. Women don't have to be allies in faith to be valued. That is how you just set that up. And it's weird to me that the way she described the value of women versus men doesn't seem to be equal, yet that doesn't seem to be a conversation she deems worth having. But anyways, the point is, why are we still enforcing this rape culture bullshit that purity culture upheld and still upholds? Women are people. Men are the main perpetrators of sexual assault against people. Men need to be taught not to assault people. That is a power structure problem. We need to address it. We don't address it by saying, oh, but she's an ally in your faith. Doesn't matter if she is or not. She's a person. What the fuck, man? <gasps> what this author really wants, uh, allegedly, is a new version of purity culture. I disagree. Um, one that doesn't commodify virginity, but she still wants everything that makes purity culture toxic. She says she doesn't want to idolize virginity or make unhealthy claims about how great sex will be during marriage, but then says that the only holy sex is sex between one man and one woman in marriage. And this is still purity culture rhetoric and is still going to produce the same end result, which is young folks having constant anxiety and shame. Speaking of which, let's uh, shift to her thoughts on queerness, which she refers to as same-sex attraction, abbreviates to SSA, or calls us as people the same-sex attracted, which I reject um, and rebuke in the name of queer Jesus. Thank you. The author is a side B Christian. If you don't know what a side B Christian is, there's side A, which is queer affirming. 
um, they believe that you can be queer and Christian, or their side B, uh, which is <laughs> this really insidious idea that if you are same-sex attracted, you are basically dealing with an affliction. It is not framed as an actual sexuality. They will not call it what it is because calling what it is means they can't change it. Um, they call it SSA, they reframe it as an affliction, as like a temptation that you are afflicted with. And right off the bat, you can see that that would, that would be pretty patronizing to us, right? <laughs> like, oh, you poor thing, dealing with SSA, like that's how it feels to me. Um, so what they think is that you are a straight person inherently because that is how God created people but you are struggling or wrestling with the affliction of SSA. So it sort of feels like a disease <laughs> which is awful. Um, framing it like this is done in an effort to seem kinder than the there's also side Y and side X which I don't fully understand but I know that I think side X is the one that's like violently homophobic. Side B just wants you to not give in to this affliction this temptation that you are <laughs> being, you know, forced into. But you haven't yet fallen away from God if you have not given in to your SSA temptation. However, um, that does not negate the fact that you start to think, no matter what, why is this happening to me? Why doesn't God love me enough to take this away from me? I hate struggling with this because it means that I'm not like everybody else. This makes me feel like the odd man out. I feel alone. I feel sad. I feel depressed, self-loathing, and on and on and on down we spiral. It's so bad, but it's not inherent to who I am. But then why am I non-stop struggling with it? I hate this, which inevitably causes you to live, to live with shame and self-loathing, which is the only way that they're going to get you to buy into Christianity in the first place, um, selling you a problem and then telling you that they have the fix for that problem, the problem that they made up in the first place. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just gay. Um, she says, SSA Christians have no place in purity culture. It is not that they are demonized. They aren't even acknowledged. Every bit of advice is geared towards cisgender heterosexuals, which leads out other orientations as well. While I will focus on the same sex attracted, how purity culture rhetoric ignored and affected those who identify as asexual, non-binary, or bisexual, for example, is also a conversation worth having. I mean, those three things, which are all wildly different from each other, <laughs> um, she never actually has a conversation on. Probably because if she did, um, her logic would fall apart, sort of like it did in this book. Anyways, the point is she pretends that this is a paragraph like opening up the conversation for the queer folks, saying, like oh they've been left out like oh thanks thanks so much for saying that we were left out of a conversation we've always wanted to you know openly exist super nice of you you're not better you're the same you're just pretending that what you're doing is a kindness and honestly a part of me wishes that you just outright call me a slur instead of pretending that you're doing me a fucking favor by saying aw poor girl has the feely feels for other girls struggling with sin there there make sure you marry a man or stay celibate I don't want that kind of kindness. She says, if you do not know, read, or listen to SSA Christians, you are missing out. Among them are a bunch of people, blah blah blah, and she mentions Jackie Hill Perry. More on that in a second. Some have gone on to enter straight marriages, while other continue to pursue celibacy in singleness. I watch their lives and live and learn so much from the way they make Jesus their ultimate source of satisfaction. I am beyond grateful for these siblings in Christ and their dedication to sexual purity at the highest cost. So that's what she offers. She says, you know, it's an affliction and you can either go in a straight marriage and be, you know, potentially traumatized um, by being somebody that you may not be sexually attracted to um, <laughs> or romantically attracted to, right? That, that sure won't fuck your kids up. Or you can just never have sex. Congratulations. That includes masturbation. This is, this is terrible. Uh, she, like most side B Christians, tokenizes Jackie Hill Perry. Jackie Hill Perry is a side B Christian who is a lesbian. She is a lesbian. She talks about in her book, Gay Girl, Good God, about being a lesbian and she says that she stopped doing queer stuff uh, and left the queer community because she felt like the only way for her to have a relationship with God was to pursue sexual holiness essentially. I don't have a problem with Jackie Hill Perry. She stopped uh, being with women, dating women, she married a man, they have a child. I don't necessarily have a problem with Jackie Hill Perry. What I have a problem with more, way more, is the tokenization of Jackie Hill Perry. Anyway, speaking of tokenization, Rachel Joy Welcher also tokenizes another friend in particular, saying, you will not carry this burden forever, and it was then that I wanted to throw myself into the abyss reading this. Um, this book for me was no different in regards to queerness as uh, reading James Dobson's Thoughts 
on queerness. So thank you so much for that. Um, in the end, calling queerness SSA as if it's an affliction and is expecting us to either fake being straight or remain celibate so that you can hold us up to other queer folks, queer folks, and say, look, these queers did it, is insidious and awful. Uh, and I hate it. <laughs> I am not afflicted with something. I'm just pansexual. I've always known I was pansexual. I've known that I was attracted to girls since I was seven. The same way I had crushes on boys at seven, I had crushes on girls at seven. I've always been this way and Jesus never said jack shit about it, just like he never said anything about hymens. So why should I believe you? Moving on because I'll get stuck in a sadness puddle if I stay at the homophobia section. All right, we are getting through it. <laughs> All right, she talks about sex being not a human need um, and not a human right. And here's where I got mad again um, because it's not that I think sex is a right. Hold on, let me read you what she says. This book took me a month, a whole month to finish. I read it from May 5th to June 5th because it took me so long to get through it. Even though it's 200 pages, it was just so incredibly painful and I had to keep putting it down. In its section titled Sex as a Right, she says, when we talk about the right to life for the unborn or for refugees, oh, the unborn, we are talking about their right to breath, food, water, and safe shelter. We are talking about the things that people need in order to survive. When sex is portrayed as a physical necessity, it joins ranks with air, food, and water as human right. An extreme but logically consistent manifestation of this thinking are incels. Ma'am. The involuntary celibate men who blame women for denying their right to sexual intercourse. But while popular culture might equate sex with our need for breath, no, 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 Stop. That's not it. Um, we're not equating sex with the need for breath. Nobody's doing that. Um, the fact is humans do better when we thrive rather than just survive. I could theoretically shove you in a room with food and water and a toilet. You'd be sheltered and I'd never have to talk to you again. You're surviving, aren't you? Are all your needs being met? No, they're not. Let me expand upon this. The human experience and the rights that we have as humans are about more than just what keeps us alive. Part of being human is exercising our ability to pursue things that better our existence. So to put this against like survival versus thrival feels like a false dichotomy and one that I don't think the author even actually believes in. If it's survival, it's a right, but if it's thriving, it's not. I don't think she actually thinks that. Things like socialization and education, right? These are not things that you need physiologically. Yet nonetheless, when we think about the education needs of children, we even put laws in place to see that those are met. We set goals for children developmentally. Why? This is not a, a physical need and therefore they don't have a right to it? False. And like I said, like, like I, I'm not making the case that you are within your rights to violate another person's autonomy like the incels are. I don't know why she had to compare, the, uh, bring that out. I'm not making a case for incels as the author would like you to think. You're not uh, supposed to violate another person's autonomy in order to meet your needs, survival needs or thriving needs, which is why you should be pro-choice. But the pursuit of needs being met does not always end in violation of another person's autonomy. If I'm experiencing a mental health crisis, I need to talk to somebody, right? Another person is not obligated to talk to me. That does not mean that I still don't have the right to pursue meeting the need of talking to somebody to work out my mental health crisis. Despite that technically not being a physio physiological need, like it's not mandated for my survival, it is still a need nonetheless. I feel like the fact that we are a social species species who are who differ from other social species means that we have to create our own understanding of what humans needs and rights really are. So while sex is certainly not something that we are owed by other people, that does not mean that on some level it is a need. You do not have the right to violate somebody's autonomy to meet that need, but that does not mean that you don't have the right to meet that need. You just don't have the right to stomp on other people's rights in your pursuit of meeting that need. She says, sex is a gift, not a right. Yes, in the same way that friendship is a gift and not a right. But the fact is you are continually pitting survival needs versus thriving needs. And if we get down to bare bones, a human can absolutely survive without other people, but they are not their best and whole self without pursuing 
their needs and things like joy. Is prison cruel? Is solitary confinement in prison cruel? Most of us would agree yes. Why? Why do we agree on that? Because it is cruel to, to expect that a human only have their basic survival needs met. The deprivation of the chance to thrive is a violation of rights and needs. Bare necessities are not our only needs as humans. I think we do have the right, the human right, to seek out what makes us thrive as long as we are not trampling on the rights of others. And what's hilarious is that I know she agrees with this because later she says Adam and Eve had everything they needed to flourish physically, emotionally, and sexually. Oh, okay. So you do understand that there are needs for thriving or flourishment, as you put it. You uh, you do understand that that is a need. You contradict yourself, my, 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 uh, my good dude, but okay. She has a section on sexual abuse within the church. Uh, some of what she says I agree with, but again, it's mostly just like common sense and I'm not gonna pat her on the back for that. But then she says regarding trying to do the right thing, like in order to protect yourself and others, like reporting sexual abusers, you are not failing to be a witness. If you don't know what a witness is, it's, it's a witness for Christ not like a witness in like crime. It's a Christian term. You are not failing to be a witness at work when you report your coworker for sexual harassment. You are showing respect for the image of Dei, image of God, in everyone. If we believe it, right, to defend the dig dignity of those created by God, we need to be consistent and protect our own dignity as image bearers. This might mean allowing your status as a servant of Christ to trump your desire to please people. This bothers me um, because of instead of addressing the power structure that leads to sexual abuse and the prevalence of abusers, we are focusing on the dignity of abusers as image bearers. I don't want to prioritize the dignity of abusers. I want to dismantle the systems that create abusers and so should you. Uh, the last two things I want to briefly touch on are her thoughts on masturbation and her thoughts on porn. I know I say briefly. I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna do my best man. Oh man do I talk constantly right? Okay regarding porn she says our sexuality is not independent from God or the call to love our neighbors. How we treat sex affects those around us. When we view pornography for example we are not just sitting against God. We are sinning against the people in that image or movie, against our spouse if we are married, and against other image bearers of God who have become depersonalized and objectified as a result. When we lust after someone in our heart, it may seem like a private sin, but it is nevertheless against a real person. Treating them selfishly in our minds is bound to show up in the way we treat them in person. Okay, she also likens certain romance books to porn, right? And in that case, who are we sinning against if the people in the book are not real? That's my first question. My second question is, can you prove it? Uh, can you prove that last person that treating them selfishly in our minds is bound to show up in the way we treat them in person? Is it selfish to think of somebody sexually all the time? Prove it. Um, and secondly, if you think that that always is true and that we will treat them that way, poorly, prove it. There's plenty of research on porn. Prove it. Um, I agree that this is probably an issue in men, but I don't agree that the issue stems from porn. I think that porn is a place in which it comes out because that's not porn's problem. That's a toxic masculinity problem. Women, if polled, probably would not say the same thing. You might find one or two who agree with that statement because on a personal level, it's level, level it's caused them to treat people differently. But the prevalent problem is going to be in men because typically between the two groups, the group getting dehumanized is women. Porn, as I said, is not the problem. The issue is toxic masculinity. There's research on this, but instead of looking into that, she decides to cite the most fucking hilarious sources of all time. Her sources were Russell Brand, yeah, that guy, um, talking about how porn was bad for him because, you know, subjective realities are definitely everyone's realities. Sure, bud. A Twitter poll that she made herself, A+, plus, A+, plus sourcing, and then Fight the New Drug, which if you don't know what Fight the New Drug is, you might remember me talking about it briefly in the video about Jesse Manassian slash Jess Corbon because when Christians want to pretend that they actually care about porn and sex trafficking but want to pretend that they're caring about it from like a mass cultural perspective and not not just a theology perspective. They back Fight the New Drug, but Fight the New Drug is made by Mormons, anyway, who are also pretending to be a non-religious entity. Anyway, Fight the New Drug is a pseudoscientific peddling organization that says that porn does things that porn does not do, and many sex therapists have come out against them saying that 
they teach children pseudoscience that teaches only the negatives about porn and not the positives. Yes, there can be positives. Porn is a nuanced issue. You can't just be like, porn always bad, porn always good. It's a lot of gray area. I can talk about it in another video if you're interested, put it down below, but I don't know that I would write the word P-O-R-N because YouTube might nix your comments. So if you want a video on porn, put a purple heart in the comments. A Fight the New Drug is not run by mental health professionals, sex therapists, any sort of like neuroscientists. They are just a group of Mormons peddling false information about porn. So the fact that she relied on Russell Brand, pseudoscience, and her own Twitter poll, yeah, that tracks. Um, if I'm gonna take advice about porn and its effects on people, I'm not gonna take this book's uh, uh, words as, as gospel. Oh man, what a joke. Um, I'm gonna actually talk to neuroscientists, which you are not, nor did you speak to one. So moving on. As far as masturbation goes, she holds the belief that it is selfish. Shocker! I believe that solo sex says to God, you are not giving me something I need, so I'm going to take it. And this attitude is so hard to keep from spreading like a cancer, not just in the act of masturbation, which quickly becomes addictive. Masturbation is something we do by ourselves, with ourselves, and for ourselves. Instead of taking our loneliness and unmet longings to God in prayer, we seek only our own relief. Instead of our spouse be given the opportunity to know us and serve us, we forsake grace and do it ourselves. Yeah, those DIY orgasms are real sinful. Instead of benefiting from the lessons we might learn from self-denial and self-discipline, we take what we want when we want it. Why does it sound like she's saying that we are raping ourselves? <sighs> she says it's not a need and that we shouldn't do it unless we're married and have permission from our spouse. Yep, that's uh, that's yikes. Because to her, sex is not about pleasure. It's not really about pleasure. It's about connection and holiness which yikes that's not the sex that i want to have i don't care if my sex is holy or not in fact i think i'd prefer it didn't be holy not like whole e oh man this joke's getting away from me masturbation for most people is not addictive um and she would know that again if she had you know utilized professionals sex professionals neurologists anybody not russell brand you could have like emailed one single neurologist but no instead she just made it a point to write a whole book where she was like oh you like orgasms by yourself you're selfish masturbation is normal healthy and not sinful i should not have to tell you this it is 2022 and we should know this um, teaching young folks that a typical process, some people don't get that urge and that's fine, but a typical process that many people go through in, you know, self-exploration that happens with our bodies is unholy. Teaching that to young people, to young people is harmful and that's purity culture. That is, that is purity culture. You are no better than Dobson and old school Josh Harris. All right, I'm done. Um, this book is harmful. It's garbage. It is trash. Shame on the author. If any, if anybody needs to live in shame for a minute, to, you know, sit in a corner and think about what they've done, it is Rachel Joy Welcher. And I hope that we get universal health care in this country, including mental health provisions, because the next generation growing up Christian and having parents who will read this book um, are going to need just as much therapy as I did after growing up in the original purity culture. So if you want to support my therapy bills, my coffee account is linked below. Uh, like and subscribe and enjoy your sex heathens i'm out thanks for watching see you next time bye scott stall scott <laughs>